CMQ investors, this is Chris Franco. Welcome to the show. And what I'm going to do in this episode is share with you the latest on my portfolio. So I do this periodically. I will do a full breakdown of my allocation and share that with you. Not to say that you should follow what I'm doing, but it's you know a way that I can be transparent with you and you can see that I'm actually applying the things that I think are that I think make sense or make the most sense for us as individual investors. Now, obviously, this is not financial advice, but I want to make sure I say that you should do your own research, don't just follow me, don't clone, don't clone me. First and foremost, 51% of my portfolio is in low cost index funds, specifically in the VU and VTI. Now those are both through Vanguard. One of the reasons I like Vanguard, and this is not a, they're not sponsoring this or anything. Vanguard is low cost and you know, your costs, keeping your costs low is a really important part of long-term investing. Um, I'm a, Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, the late great Jack or John Bogle is a, a definitely a hero of mine. Um, and I keep it simple. I keep the VU and the VTI. And Warren Buffett, I believe he has said, uh, you know, in the day of his untimely demise, his widow, uh, the money that she receives, 90% of that will go into the VU. He might not have said the VU, but he said the S&P 500. And considering that he said that the uh, Jack Bogle deserves to have a statue erected in his honor, um, I can only assume it would be the VU. So that's 51% of my profile. Now, I moving forward, I always want to have a minimum uh, of my portfolio, at least 51% in the VU or in the low cost index fund strategy here. And the reason for that is because of all the data on how as individual investors, stock picking over time tends to be a losing strategy. You know, we might panic sell, we might make the wrong pick. And even though I've increased my, my uh, investment IQ quite a bit over the years, I want to maintain, you know, make sure I don't get overconfident because overconfidence is a killer for us as investors. Next biggest position, believe it or not, is Alibaba. 12% of the portfolio is in Alibaba. I understand that's definitely riskier. Um, I am very well versed in all things Alibaba, but I recognize there's, uh, there's a large risk there. Um, I'm willing to accept it. I'm comfortable with it. And it is a long-term holding just like any stock in my portfolio. It's meant to be held for the long term. Um, in Alibaba's case, I'd say my timeline minimum is 2030. Now, I have a diagram on my Twitter uh, Twitter page. I've pinned it there that shares what some of the greatest investors say. When is it time to sell a stock? So obviously, there's, there's always a time. But um, assuming those things don't happen, then I will be riding the Alibaba wave for quite some time. Next up is Apple. Uh, very, you know, very happy to own Apple. I've owned Apple since, I think, 2015. Um, and I've added to it over the years. I haven't added to it in recent, let's say the year, last year and a half, but I believe the dividend that uh, Apple produces, I have that automatically reinvested. So Apple's another long-term play. Um, I, I don't know why it's, I'm saying it's another long-term play. Everything is a long-term play. Next up is Berkshire B. Now I recently added a little bit more to this. Berkshire to me is, you know, it could do worse. It could do better than the S and P 500, but it's a company that's so well managed and, you know, being the Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, um, student that I am and just being how much I've learned from them, you know, I'm just proud to own that company. Frankly, I, I feel great about it. Um, I'm very optimistic about the long-term future and I know it inside and out. And that's important for me with any individual stock that I own. I, I want to know it inside and out because that keeps me from panic selling, which, you know, that's ultimately one of the biggest mistakes we can make. Because uh, nothing interrupts the compounding process like having to realize gains. Okay, next up here, Costco. Um, actually, I forgot to mention cash. So cash is 7% of my portfolio right now. I don't mean cash like one of my dogs. I mean cash is in actual cash in my portfolio. Um, you know, I look at it not from a standpoint of, you know, what my asset allocation should be, but I just look at it as opportunity costs. If I find something that I think I want to add to or there's maybe something comes along, there's a really good opportunity um, you know, then I have some cash available to pour in there. I might lower that percentage a little bit over the coming weeks uh, or months because I have, um, you know, my emergency savings. I've talked about this in the podcast. I don't need the money in the brokerage account per se. It's not really doing anything just sitting there. Um, I'd almost rather put it in like a high yield savings account, even though that's barely making anything now, um, you know, with the current rates. But still, I think I'm, um, I'll probably be allocating some more of that cash in the coming weeks or months. So I'll have updates on that for you. Um, I did allocate some of that recently, though, and as I mentioned, Costco was something that I added to. Um, Costco is a company that I believe in. Also, I know it inside and out. Um, it's an amazing business. It's one that I think still has a lot of room to grow. It's not cheap or anything, 
uh, but it's something I feel very safe with. And I don't buy things based on something like a, if there's a recession coming or not. That's not something I think I can really time. Um, but I look at Costco as something that is, um, you know, always of value to people, regardless of the economic times. And even right now with the high gas prices, I've heard from people. I, I live in New York City, so I'm not driving anywhere. Um, but Costco has some of the cheapest gas, you know, in the country right now, which again, adding value. Um, they're also, you should look, if you're interested, read into what they're doing in China um, and just how their model works there as well. It's an, it's an amazing business. It really is. Um, I encourage you to learn more about it. I'll try to make some videos about it in, in due time. Um, Microsoft. Now, Microsoft was not a company that I ever was thinking would become one of the main holdings. Uh, it's just done so well. So the percentage grew a lot. Uh, Microsoft is a company that when I first started getting into reading 10Ks and really recognizing the importance of that, um, this is going to sound a little superficial, but it has, it's one of the most well-organized companies. I remember reading their 10K and being like, wow, this is like put together like this magical puzzle. Um, so if you're interested in it, check out the, the Microsoft 10K. I'm not saying you should invest in Microsoft, but I do feel Microsoft is a, a solid hold and it just doesn't make sense to sell it and realize that gain. I'd rather let the compounding process do its thing. Um, and last but not least is Google. So Google's a very uh, small percentage of my portfolio relatively. Uh, it's something that, uh, some of it was like a, um, you know, I moved over money from a big institution and they had me in some individual holdings and Google was one of them and I just didn't make sense to sell any of it. Um, and I also added to it a little bit recently because um, I understand that business inside and out. It's within my circle of competence. I don't, I'm not banking on like insane returns or anything, but it's very, very safe and solid. Um, and I think there's there's upside available. It just doesn't make sense to sell. Um, and I think that goes back to this bigger point. You know, if you have something that's working, a lot of times when we sell to realize the gains, we're actually interrupting that compounding process. And as a long-term investor, as someone who I think I've cracked the code on how to really create wealth in the stock market, or at least the most reliable way to do that, it all comes down to long-term compounding and let, letting the, the magic of compounding uh, or excuse me, letting the, uh, letting compounding work its magic. So, but that's my portfolio. Now I'll keep you in, uh, keep you updated. I do want to watch something here. I don't want individual positions to start taking up too much more beyond like 11 or 12%. Um, I'm not going to hold myself to that and be overly, you know, rule based because I've learned from Warren Buffett and others, you know, that's, it's not only natural that your best positions are going to become a larger and larger portion of your portfolio. But one thing that I am, very kind of strict on is keeping at least 50% in low cost index funds. And that, you know, hedges against my own stupidity, uh, potentially overconfidence. And I just, I know it's a sound approach. So I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. You know, I'd love to hear what your biggest positions are. Let me know. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please check out some of the other videos, uh, subscribe, give it a thumbs up and thank you for watching. I appreciate it. So once again, my name is Chris Franco. This is CMQ investing and we'll talk soon.